Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Here from our conference room in uh, Reno, Nevada. I'd like to welcome you all. Um, if we want to go ahead and bring up the slides, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for the introduction, Suzanne. Looking forward to uh, yet another year here at uh, UCSD. <clears throat> and again, as I say every year, uh, these presentations are for you. Uh, so if you have questions, I'll do my best uh, to get to them in the chat, uh, the chat box, amongst other things. Uh, please let me know if you uh, have a question or feel free to stop me along the way if you need to. Uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, I'll have uh, my uh, email and contact information as well as our website. I've also, uh, in addition to this presentation, I have uh, submitted a uh, handout to Suzanne. So if you're interested in that, it's basically a recap of everything we're discussing here in a nice PDF form uh, that she can uh, send to you or you can email me directly. And we attached it when we sent out the reminder to everybody. Perfect. Okay. So. That's got some you know, more in-depth information that we're gonna go through today, but let's go ahead and get started as I don't you know, wanna take up too much of your time here today. Uh, the world of ESG uh, investing, sustainable investing, uh, very uh, interesting topic in my opinion, because um, I see from Tali to everyone, does everyone else have audio? Is everyone ever able to hear me okay? Suzanne, you can hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can hear you, Ryan, just fine. Hear you. Okay. Okay, perfect, perfect. And if everybody would just check real quick to make sure they're on mute there uh, so we don't get any background noise. So let's go ahead and flip slides here if you don't mind. And who's running the slides today, Suzanne? It's Denise who's running it for us. All right, One of you, our Denise. chancellor scholars. Yeah, perfect. All right, so sustainable response and investing strategies overview and definition. So the plan today is to give you a background on um, uh, what, what ESG investing is, what sustainable investing is. Sustainable is kind of like the overarching uh, term, uh, but all the different definitions, I think there's a lot of confusion out there since the rise of sustainable investing has really been within the last half of the decade. It's, it's, it's really accelerated itself. Now it's been around for a little bit longer than that, a couple of decades, um, but we've seen a, a market increase in interest in the space and for good reason. Okay? So let's start by going over some definitions. We'll go over some different uh, facets and, and definitions within sustainable investing. Then we'll get to some of the common misnomers with sustainable investing. You know, do you get the same performance? Do you, uh, you know, how do you go about investing? And then we'll lay out a path or a plan of how you actually go about building out these types of portfolios. I'll show you how we do it, what our process is, and what resources we use. Um, and then I'll, I'll finish with a couple uh, things to watch out for, pitfalls uh, that we see in the space. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started here. Next slide, please, Denise. And so uh, the first thing I, I wanna cover is, uh, you know, there's a great quote, anybody here a, uh, a hockey fan by chance? I'm not much of a hockey fan, but I, I think most people are familiar with probably the greatest hockey player of all time, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, he's famous for saying, you know, he wasn't the fastest or the strongest hockey player, but what made him one of the best players of all time is instead of skating to the puck, he would skate to where the puck was going. And I think that's how you can think of ESG investing or sustainable investing in the entire investing landscape. This is where investing is going. This is not where investing, uh, I, I would say it's become mainstream possibly in the last year or two. Uh, but I know in the beginning of my career uh, back in 2008, 2009, literally no one was talking about this. And we'll go through some of the different uh, facets of how that change has come about, what's caused that, and what the numbers actually look like. So let's first define what ESG stands for. So it stands for environmental, social, and governance factors, right, and how they're intertwined into investing. So under environmental, you have things like climate change, energy efficiency, air, and water pollution. Uh, some of the social things uh, that you may be familiar with, customer protection, community relations, a big one now, data protection and privacy, and then governance, right? How are companies being run? What do their boards look like? Uh, what are their accounting practices? And how are they implementing them in their workforce? So again, the key questions in this presentation and also in the report I gave you, uh, does sustainable investing forego profit for principal? So we'll go over some of those numbers. Uh, you know, what ESG factors appeal to today's investors? right? Uh, what are the main things that uh, people are talking about today? How do they implement that? And then, you know, what are the trends and what are some of the challenges that investors 
uh, face. Next slide, please. So, you know, again, um, when you think of ESG investing, I want you to actually think about sustainable investing because sustainable investing can actually be segmented into three different uh, segments. And I think it's often referred to as ESG, but ESG is simply the analysis that goes on top of the financial analysis. It's not there to replace it, uh, but it's a further scrutiny or a further uh, dive into uh, you know, what type of companies you may want to invest in, whether it's a mutual fund or an ETF or uh, owning individual securities, stocks, bonds, et cetera, et cetera. So exclusionary investing, which is the older form of sustainable investing, was avoiding objectionable companies and industries. And that, that you know, started, I would think, um, you know, primarily with folks that, you know, maybe did not want to have tobacco companies or firearm companies in their portfolios, a lot of religious exemptions for various reasons. Uh, and then what is the newer trend or what's really given rise to ESG or sustainable investing is this impact investing. The thought that you want your portfolio either to have impact or to match what you believe, your own ethos, how you feel about the world, and that you want the investments you make to have impact in the future. Again, skating to where the puck is. Next slide, please. So again, you know, ideal strategies, principles, values here supersede financial considerations when evaluating investments. That doesn't necessarily mean, okay, hey, I'm, I want to invest in something clean energy or uh, the movement from carbon uh, to electrical, you know, cars or carbon-based fuel, fossil fuel-based cars to to electrical cars. Does that mean I'm necessarily going to give up returns? No, not at all. All right. So again, we can look at you know, two sides of sustainable investing and one being here on the left, impact, sustainable and thematic. But again, these all are subcategories of sustainable investing that all have different uh, definitions in, as well. Impact investing applies, you know, targeted and measurable progress. We see this a lot in family offices and institutional investing. You know, they actually uh, will set goals uh, that they want to see out of the different companies that they invest in, whether it's, you know, we want to see at least 50% of the board uh, being composed of uh, uh, someone of color or uh, of a uh, uh, female and uh, male ratio of at least 50-50. Um, and so there's all these different thematic approaches and or wickets that are created. One of the interesting things about ESG investing is there's nothing at the government level when I say government, I'm referring to, you know, the, the governing bodies of the financial services industry, whether it's SEC or FINRA, that really encapsulate or provide guidance to either funds, ETFs, broker dealers saying this is the definition of sustainable investing or this, you know, qualifies you to say it's sustainable investing. And that's one of the big fit, pitfalls in today's landscape with sustainable investing is it really sustainable investing? Is it really falling under from a making and impacting my thematic approach? Or if I'm on the right side here, a value-based or exclusionary approach, um, you know, am I abiding by these? It's much easier on the right side of this equation. Exclusionary, it's pretty easy to look at your portfolio and say, well, I have tobacco, you know, I have, uh, you know, Philip Morris or um, some, you know, and I'll give you an example recently um, of a client uh, that thought that they had a mutual fund. Um, you know, they wanted to do sustainable investing. One of the big things was they wanted to exclude all tobacco and firearms. And we were able to show them within the Morning, uh, Morningstar analysis of the funds they held, two or three of the funds they had, including a rising dividends fund, had Philip Morris in it, right? Which obviously we know is a tobacco company. A very good dividend if you're looking for income. But if that is what you're trying to exclude from your portfolio, then you don't want to be invested certainly in that company and they were doing it through um, the mutual fund. Let me also, while I'm here, if you are an index investor and you're trying to combine index investing, whether it's through Vanguard or through ETFs of some kind, it is almost impossible to be a sustainable or impact investing uh, or at least follow that ethos because just by definition, an index investment, unless it's following the newer um, sustainable investing indexes, but if you're just following the S&P 500, uh, John, I'm sure I'd be happy to get to that. Um, unless you're following, uh, you know, one of the uh, sustainable investing ETFs, it is impossible by owning the S&P 500 or the Dow or QQQ, which is the uh, NASDAQ 
uh, ETF, you are not excluding many of the things that you, you know, potentially do not want in your portfolio. So I'm sp uh, specifically thinking of tobacco, firearm, and then of course, a lot of the uh, big energy companies that you know, are fossil fuel producers. So next slide, please. All right, so uh, just you know, a graphical way here to look at, let's start on the left. This is your traditional investment, right? Strategy is designed to maximize returns for a given level of risk. Everybody's familiar with you know, typically how we build portfolios, right? And I say we, I'm not talking about my team and stuff, but in general, how you build a portfolio, you try to maximize the return for a given level of risk, you're comfortable with X or Y amount of risk, and you build a portfolio based on that, you diversify, et cetera, et cetera. So what ESG investing does on top of that, right, is an integration of this environmental, and that's why ESG is actually an analysis. It's not an investing style. It's sustainable investing, and then you have all those subsets we just discussed, but ESG is really the analysis, right? And so what you're doing is you're putting an overlay on your traditional asset allocation strategy and your risk return strategy, and you're screening for these different environmental, social, or governance factors that you wish to include or exclude from your portfolio. All right. So on top of that, if you do an in impact investing, right, you actually are going to have some type of tool or measurement, right, with regards to the impact that you want to provide. And you go a step further, social responsibly, you, you know, aim to avoid what doesn't align with any of your values. And if companies, you know, uh, many people maybe on this uh, presentation have read some of the things of Facebook lately uh, that came out in the reports in the Wall Street Journal. Facebook traditionally has qualified for many of the ESG screeners. And you may, at this point, if your values don't align, if you think, well, maybe they are targeting and or hurting, um, you know, younger teens and stuff with their Instagram uh, accounts and the way they have been, um, I don't say mismanaging is not the right word, uh, the way they have not had the, the proper oversight, that might be a reason that you would exclude a certain company. And I'm not, you know, uh, uh, going after Facebook, I'm just giving an example here. On the other hand, you may say, hey, Ford, is a company I want to add to my portfolio now. Uh, maybe you saw recently uh, the announcement that Ford is targeting 80% of its uh, production of cars to be electrical and non-fossil fuel based. Uh, that just came on the Wall Street Journal, I believe, yesterday, the day before. Uh, so, you know, those are the reasons, those are the screeners, if you will, uh, that you would put on top of your traditional strategy uh, or tr traditional asset allocation strategy that you would create. And again, put all these uh, additional, uh, additional screeners on top of it. And that can, of course, include philanthropy as well. And I put that here on the very right because, you know, that's essentially uh, turning money over to other enterprises and or 501c3s that have certain, um, you know, edicts within their perspectives that they want to uh, provide for. So next slide, please. So, and again, you know, just reviewing ESG as an analysis, right? So it is essentially identifying within. So again, it does not replace traditional financial analysis. So you have your traditional financial analysis where you're looking at companies, you're looking at balance sheets, you're looking at income statements, you're doing all these things, right? And then the ESG component augments that traditional financial analysis, right? And that's where you get the environmental, social and governance and those different screeners that you can add on top of your traditional financial analysis. So it's not a whole nother subset. subset. You're not starting from zero. You're, you're applying your traditional financial analysis and then putting these overlays on top of it to match you know, all the different things that you can have under sustainable investing. Next slide. So again, you know, most ESG metrics concern risk mitigation at the foremost, right? Um, you know, interesting from the Harvard Business Review, and I'll just read this out here, though, the through line that ties together these new investing models and strategies is quite simple. While they have generated competitive returns, it so happens that they've also positively benefited society, right? Why? Well, folks that are interested in ESG investing tend to have longer holding periods and skew towards higher quality names. Let's just look at the composition of the markets, and I have a slide coming up here in a second, but you know, what has been the leader, essentially since we came out of the Great Recession, what has been the leading sector within the S&P 500 here in the United States? It's been technology. Well, many, if not most of these technology companies are either ESG leaning or would qualify as sustainable investment companies, right? You know a lot of the names um, in the back of your mind. What has been one of the sectors in the S&P 500 that has performed the worst since the Great Recession? far and away has been the energy complex, right? And the energy um, segment of the market. 
has far underperformed the greater market. And that is a result of this shift from, you know, I want to buy companies that have value and great balance sheets and large dividends. And I really want to focus what I'm buying in my portfolio on things that either make an impact or that I really believe in what they're doing. Next slide, please. Right. So what are the different factors? What are the things that, that folks are looking for? So uh, they did a, a, a poll, Wells Fargo and Gallup uh, did a retirement survey in February 2020. It's about a year and a half ago. How likely are you to invest in funds that are focused on each of the following issues or goals? Very interested, someone interested, not too interested, not interested at all was their question. And you can see here, number one concern is reducing pollution, right? Air, water, ocean. And you can see very interested, nearly 50% of respondents. And then if we add in somewhat interested, over 80% or eight out of every 10 you know, people that they interviewed were concerned about reducing pollution in, in the world, right? And then promoting responsible corporate governance. I think, you know, coming out of the Great Recession, uh, even going back to, uh, you know, the, the fall of the Enrons and the world comes, you know, people want to see the companies that they're going to put their money and their capital into, they want them to see them governed with a certain ethics and not just profit, profit, profit. But how are you treating your employees? What are you doing to benefit their lives? Uh, you know, very good book, in my opinion, uh, that I read a long, long time ago before business school was uh, called Nuts. And it's about the Southwest Airlines story and Herb Kelleher. And they always said, or the, the, the one thing I can remember about them asking him, well, you know, what do you do to put your customer first? And he said, no, 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 I don't put my customer first. He said, I put my employees first. And I put my employees first. Because if I know if my employees are extremely happy and they're treated correctly, that they will treat our customers the same way. And I think, you know, you know, obviously there's going to be, you know, outliers, but I, you know, I travel a lot on the airlines and I prefer to travel on Southwest, you know, nine out of 10 times. And it's not because uh, I read the book nuts. It's because it's truly a better experience than it is for me personally on any of the other airlines I go, you know, despite the fact that it's, you know, pretty much a large cattle car. So, Anyhow, next slide, please. This is really an interesting slide because it shows how the market has shaped over time. Like, you know, you, you talk about the market, what are the largest capitalization companies? And everybody today can name, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon. But in 1975, the largest five companies by market capitalization were IBM, ExxonMobil, Procter & Gamble, General Electric, and 3M, okay? So, you know, where are those companies today? Well, you know, most people are familiar with what's happening with General Electric. IBM is still around, but not nowhere near top five company. Uh, ExxonMobil has probably been the one that has taken, well, other than General Electric, one of the biggest hits here. And that has been because of the movement away from things that people don't want to invest in. And more importantly, in 1975, and this is really interesting, tangible assets accounted for 83% of value of the five largest companies, the S&P 500, tangible assets, meaning like actual physical things. Whereas now intangible assets, like reputation, brand value, intellectual property, they make up 84% of the S&P 500's value. So that it, it make, it, it begs the reason why companies are so focused on their public uh, perception, how people view them, um, are they doing the right things? Are they, uh, you know, being ethical in the way they promote business? Uh, certainly companies, especially here in a capitalist society, are still, you know, generating profits for shareholders. But that intellectual or that, that, that intangible asset and intellectual property and brand value and reputation has become so unbelievably important in today's market. And that is sustainable ESG analysis and sustainable investing. And it shows you right there how is it completely morphed our entire market and our entire, uh, you know, leading companies here in the United States and where people are putting their assets. Next slide, please. So let's go into some of the actual metrics of sustainable investing here. I'm 25 minutes in, so I think we're doing well on time. Um, so accelerating adoption, growing product universe. Next slide. So this is a pretty phenomenal slide, if you think about it. From 2005 to 2020, Sustainable investments by money managers have grown by nearly 30x, okay, 30 times. And you can see it really, really has taken off since 2016, right? I mean, the amount of growth in this space is incredible. Um, I believe, you know, Susanna afforded me a question uh, from someone that had said, you know, uh, abandoning a current strategy to, to, to move to a sustainable strategy, you know, it doesn't seem like a good idea. 
um, because there's other implications. And I would completely agree with that assessment, specifically in a, you know, a taxable account. But I also think you know, people will have to make their own decision. Every single person on this call is going to make a decision on what really is important to them, right? And if making impact and, you know, excluding things that they don't believe in, et cetera, et cetera, is more important than having to pay some taxes uh, because they have to sell off Exxon at a, you know, large gain, or they have to sell off a company like Philip Morris or something, or even the Constellation brands, which you go Constellation brands, that's, you know, beer. I, you know, I'm okay with that. Well, a lot of people don't know Constellation Brands has almost a $300 million investment in Canopy Growth Company. Canopy Growth Company, of course, creates a vape pens and, and marijuana pens. You know, you may say, well, I have no problem with you know, marijuana. It's legal in so many states, like California, yada, yada. But you may say, well, I, I don't believe in vape pens because, uh, you know, that's the same thing as a cigarette and it's more addictive, right? So, you know, again, just giving examples, uh, I think it's important to really understand the companies you're going to invest in. More importantly, the, the mutual funds are going to invest in because of their underlying holdings as well. All right. Um, and, and you'll see here in a second, we have actually a term that's coming up. So part of this growth in assets and money going into managers into sustainable investments, part of that is just marketing. And that's why it's really important to understand the screeners you're using and, and the research you're using, and more importantly, the people that you're working with to get there, because it's really easy for a fund manager and their perspective. Take a large cap growth fund and say, you know, one day or one year, we're a large cap growth fund. We're not doing very well. We need more capital. Oh, now we're a sustainable large cap growth fund. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Right? Again, because there's no governing body at FINRA or SEC to say, nope, that's not a sustainable fund, or we're finding you because you're saying you're sustainable and you're not. Right? It really takes these overlays or this ESG analysis to understand are they really doing the things they say they're doing? Are the funds doing the things they say? You know, uh, again, if you have a wonderful plan at Fidelity uh, in the 403B, 457 plan, but there are some things that they say, like, and I know Fidelity has said that they're moving all to ESG type stuff, but, you know, I had been our uh, analyst on our team, looked today at a couple of the Morningstar uh, analysis or underlying holdings of some of the largest Fidelity funds. And I can tell you, I found, you know, ExxonMobil, Philip Morris, all in those funds, right? So, you know, again, if you're really into sustainable investing, you need to know what you own because as something like this happens, you have this massive growth. Money managers aren't stupid. You know, they're going to do everything they can from a marketing perspective to try to draw in this, you know, new interest in ESG investing or sustainable investing. Next slide. All right. So, you know, this, this, this graph, I think, just really shows the growth, especially over the last two years. This is a quarterly breakdown of estimated quarterly flows uh, into U.S. sustainable funds. And you can see, you know, yeah, we had some positive uh, movement into the space in 2013, 2014. That's really when I was introduced to it, uh, started discussing it. I know, Suzanne, we did a, you know, an ESG slash sustainable investing presentation, I think, back in 2016. Um, and, you know, so we're kind of on the forefront of that, but really in the last two years, it has just completely exploded. And that's why I think you're hearing a lot more about it. Next slide, please. So this is the introduction of all the different products from open-end funds, think of those as mutual funds and exchange-traded funds, ETFs, right? And you can see, I know it's hard to tell the differentiation in the colors uh, on the, uh, the Zoom there, but what you can see here is look at all these new products coming to market. And again, Never doubt Wall Street's uh, ability to create a whole bunch of products to, you know, follow a trend, similar to how they created a whole bunch of, you know, real estate products and, you know, collateralized debt obligations, et cetera, et cetera, back in 2007, 2008. Am I saying there's a bubble in ESG or sustainable investing? No, I'm not saying that at all. There are many good quality companies in there, but there is a, a lot of money chasing these products. And so, again, I think it's very important to understand what you're investing in and how that process is being driven. Next slide, please. So if we look at you know, the genesis of this ESG or sustainable investing, we can look here at money managers, meaning large institutional. So money managers being like mutual fund uh, investors and then institutional investors, that's gonna be uh, like UCRP, University of California Retirement Plan. That's gonna be CalPERS, CalSTRS. Uh, those are considered institutional investors. And you see, they really, really have led the way in you know, converting to sustainable slash ESG investing. If we go to the next slide, please, you'll see What's happening now is the retail investor, the retail investor is you and me, right? Individuals, including high net worth individuals. Um, this, this trend 
that was started by institutional investors is the retail investors really, really catching on to it now. And if you go from 20 to 27%, right, that's a 7% increase on 20%, you know, that's a 35% increase in the amount of interest in just four years from retail investors, right? That's a large, large increase. And especially since retail investors don't have nearly the capital that institutional investors have. Next slide. So, so what's driving it? Well, we know now that millennials are the largest demographic in this country, right? And you can see here the percent who have reviewed their portfolio for impact, well, millennials is almost 80% versus baby boomers down at 28%. And I think that, that that shows you right there in a nutshell, in one graph, how the market and where investments are going, how it's changing based on US demographics, right? U.S. I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, right? I'm born in 1976, um, and certainly work with. And everyone, please check your uh, mute again. I got somebody in the background. Sounds like. Um, but you can see as this this demographic change has occurred, right? This is driving the markets towards sustainable investing and towards companies that um, are you know abiding by these different principles that are of interest to this demographic. Next slide, please. All right. So this is the growth of you know, generational assets and this is you know, mapping trend in generational wealth. You see the silent generation, which is before the baby boomers, right? It's going down because obviously they're passing away and passing their, their wealth on to the baby boomers and Gen X. And you can see the slopes for millennials and Gen X are the highest. And I would expect baby boomers to roll over and start declining here in the next 10 years. Well, we know that Gen Xers and millennials are adopters of sustainable investing. So this trend most likely will only really continue into the future. Next slide. So what's, what, what is the performance, right? Are you giving up performance because you, uh, you know, you, because you wanna invest with impact? Well, let's look. So the next slide here is the MSCI, all country world index. We're taking all stocks in the entire world, right? And we're putting against the MSCI, all country world index ESG leaders. And you could see pretty much it's in lockstep for the most part, right? So you're really not giving up a ton of performance. You're not even giving up any performance. And if we look at, let's go to the next slide here, a couple of metrics. Uh, again, this is just a, a three and five year period. These are the top quartile. And you can see here, you know, 40% of the top quartile are ESG on a, a, four, or a three year basis. And on a five year basis, 32%. But this next slide, next slide, please. 41 of 56 Morningstar ESG indexes outperformed their non-ESG equivalents since inception, right? So is that because of the recent trends and all the money flow in? Well, yeah, you could make that argument. Or is this part of a longer term secular trend? Well, based on the demographics and the shift as the silent generation continues to leave or pass away, and as baby boomers start beginning to pass away in large numbers, and as millennials and Gen X compromise a much larger portion and Gen Ys, a much larger portion, or excuse me, Gen Zers, a larger portion of the economy, will we actually see an acceleration of sustainable investing? Well, it's, it's hard to predict, but it looks like that's exactly what's happening. Next slide. And here are the performance metrics for, for different funds. If we look at performance, right, the top one here, 80% of sustainability leader indexes outperformed their non ESG equivalent since the end of 2012 from a price return. But we know also, if, if we know anything about financial analysis, you can't just look at absolute return. You have to look at return with regards to risk, right? If I have a 50-50 portfolio, let's just say 50 stock and 50 bond, and my friend has 100% stock portfolio and he outperforms me or she outperforms me by 2 or 3% annualist, I would say, well, of course, I'm 100% stock. It's a much riskier portfolio. Well, it's the same thing here, right? So the performance is better. Well, what about the volatility? Well, 80% of sustainability layers indexes had higher volatility scores, implying a lower range of possible long-term returns. Not lower long-term returns, a lower dispersion of long-term returns, right? Which is what we want. We want less dispersion. We want less volatility. Financial health, 90% of sustainability leader indexes had a higher financial health score. The factor assesses the strength of a firm, a financial position, ranks companies and the likelihood they will enter financial distress. Right? And then the economic moat, 50% of sustainability leaders indexes had a higher exposure to the economic moat, meaning that they had a competitive advantage that they were able to protect, right? Their, their profits were more insulated from competition. Next slide, please. So as I'm about 35 minutes in, I wanna leave some uh, time for questions here at the end. What's the future of sustainable investing? 
You know, what are the challenging trends, right? Next slide. Well, first is the knowledge gap, right? Is the understanding, and I think that's why most of you are here today, what is, you know, we hear sustainable investing, we hear ESG, we hear impact investing, we hear thematic investing, we hear exclusionary investing. You know, what is it? Well, the majority of it is educating yourself and really understanding what the different facets of it are and what really appeals to you in your portfolio. Uh, here, uh, in, uh, Montable uh, did a uh, an assessment here in September 2019, or part of their research, 59% of respondents do not know an ESG approach to saving investments is even possible, right? 47% would welcome greater support and advice and EGS from their advisors, and 49% would like their advisors to provide more information on this topic. I mean, that's one of the reasons, you know, in our practice four years ago, we really began to dive deep into this, because we, we and I don't want to say I could totally have predicted the, the massive increase in the last two years, but certainly there was a drive for this, and I, quite frankly, I have to thank UCSD because a lot of that re those requests came from UCSD and folks at UCSD that really wanted their investments to match, you know, what they believed in. Next slide, please. So what are some of the I was risks just going to say, I'm going to jump in, Ryan. I would say that mm -hmm. if you surveyed UCSD investors, I bet that mm -hmm. no matter the age, you would see us a whole lot higher than the baby boom line. Absolutely. Uh, you know, again, and to your point, Suzanne, uh, you know, that is one of the reasons when we were back in Morgan Stanley that we really began uh, digging deep into sustainability and sustainable investing. Unfortunately, Morgan Stanley did not have as nearly a robust uh, platform as we do here at the Wells Fargo Investment Institute, which I'll show you here in a second. But you know, I think it, it really opened my eyes, and I think you're exactly right, because as advisors, you know, we want to work, obviously, with people that have money, and the reason we want to work with people that have money is because, A, that's how we get paid, and B, that's who we can help. I mean, that's the reality of it, right? That's why we're called financial advisors, not life advisors. And so, um, you know, you bring up a great point in that you know, about four years ago, I really started to get a lot of questions about, you know, how do we exclude certain things I don't want in my portfolio? How do we you know, invest in, you know, you know, technologies I really believe in or I want to look at. And I think, you know, that was kind of the beginning for me of an eye opening. And again, thanking UCSD for that, um, of, of the trend that was coming, right? And I totally agree with you, Suzanne. I bet you if you surveyed the, the baby boomer generation that works at UCSD, the numbers would be closer to the overall millennial generation, right? So what are the, 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 the challenges here, right? So lack of not a standardized terminology I mentioned earlier, there's, there's no real SEC or FINRA guidelines on how you can call yourself an ESG fund or an ESG ETF, right? You could just call yourself that, right? So it's up to really advisors working with clients to determine, does this really work in my portfolio? Is this something that I really want there? There's a lack of standardization of the data and there's a lack of oversight and accountability. Are they really doing what they say they're doing, right? And how do we monitor that? So next slide, please. And this is where I said, we're gonna get into a couple of terms. Um, that I think are really important to understand if you want to be a sustainable investor, number one is greenwashing. You know, greenwashing is an attempt to capitalize on the growing demand for environmentally sound products. And greenwashing can convey a false impression that an investment manager fund is environmentally sound. We're, you know, again, this is a piece I took from WFII, but we're attempting to solve this problem with our proprietary methodology. So you really have to dig in how are stocks, companies, uh, funds, ETFs, how are they being screened to make sure they're really going by the prospectus. If a mutual fund goes outside of its prospectus um, with regards to, uh, you know, they want 80% in large cap, 10%, you know, in mid and 10% small, and the SEC finds out they had 50% in, in mid small cap when they blew up, it, you know, investors can sue, right? Because they, they busted their, their prospectus. But if, if, you know, prospectus, they say they're, you know, ESG compliant or they are sustainable investors, there's no real measurement for that, right? Or at least from a legal standpoint. They can say that all day long, but you have to have these different screeners to understand what you're really looking at. Certified B corporations, business and social enterprise that balance purpose with profit, right? And there's actually a company out there that are verified by B Lab and they legally obligated to consider the impact of these decisions, employees, clients, suppliers, local community and the environment. Right, started in 2007 and today there's more than 2,400 of them certified, right? Uh, transitioning brown companies to green companies. I think that's kind of what I mentioned with, with Ford earlier. And then, uh, you know, I'll just exclude the last one there because that's more on the, the, the donor side. So, um, so next slide, please. What are the trends, you know, looking forward again and skating to the puck, right? 
or where it's going to be, excuse me, you know, energy, data, protection, animal rights. These are the things that we see on the horizon as, as things that, you know, people are going to want to see. Next slide. Here's a, you know, quick timeline of the history uh, of ESG investing or sustainable investing, right? Uh, again, you know, if you want any of this, I'd be happy um, to send this to you. But you can see here, 2030, Microsoft budget to become carbon negative, right? 2040, New York committed to general carbon-free electricity. Amazon pledges to become carbon neutral. 2045, California pledges to become carbon neutral. So these are all those things that are in the works. And see, this is a trend that's not going away, right? If anything, this is going to only accelerate and grow, in our opinion. Next slide. So, so how do we go about doing, you know, growing a sustainable investment strategy? So this is what we do, okay? So again, and there, I know there's so many different ways people would go about this, but, you know, I want to just kind of go over our process here and how we go through this. Next slide. All right. So the first thing is, is define the goals. And just like we talked about from an ESG standpoint, right? Um, are we satisfying value preferences? Are we, you know, are we generating a financial benefit, affecting meaningful change? What, let's define what type of sustainable investing we want to do. Do we want to do impact investing? Do we want to be able to measure how the companies are, are going about uh, impact investing? Are we just looking to exclude certain types of companies, whether it's energy or tobacco or firearms or anything like that? I mean, what exactly are we looking to do? So you have to define those goals from that ESG perspective, right? Next slide. And then you have to, once you, you know, define the goal and you look at areas of potential focus to help guide the selection of very sustainable investing options, right? Um, you know, are you concerned about climate change, environmental pollution, you're looking to align faith-based or religious? Those are two totally different um, investors that want totally different things. And it's important to be able to identify that. Next slide. And then, of course, just like you would do in any uh, financial portfolio, you need to reassess it periodically. You need to look at the funds. You need to understand what's in the underlying funds, in the underlying ETFs, right? Are the portfolio links still aligned with the investor values? And next slide. And so this is crazy because, it, you know, if I look back at my career at, you know, whether it was at Morgan Stanley or prior to that at Edward Jones, and since I've been here at UCSD, this is my third firm now. So how serious are we about ESG investing? I put this in here because, next slide, this is the resource that we have. I mean, you can see here, this is, I just pulled this page. You can see this is uh, updated here on September 17th. This is me pulling this off today. And I mean, client approved resources, you can see all these different presentations, PDFs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, talking to the different, you see on the right side, meet the teams, portfolio specialists, global manager research analysis coverage, equity research team. I mean, specific teams, uh, you know, global uh, asset allocation researchers, all these different things on this particular, I could tell you right now, when I started my career, this, there was nothing like this on sustainable investing. And even as recently as 2016, 2017, when we first did a, you know, ESG sustainable investing presentation, and I was at Morgan Stanley, we had nothing like this. So this is all coming about, come about in the last couple of years, right? And so I think that's great. If you are someone that is interested in this, these are the resources that are available to your advisors, right? And so make sure that they have something like this, right, that they can take you to, that they can provide all this different. And you can see there on the bottom left, electrical vehicles and hydrogen. We even have, you know, research and stuff on that. So it's great. Um, you know, again, I think uh, it's easy to do that greenwashing, but make sure there's some actual, you know, research and, and, and screeners behind any investment you're going to put your money with or any investment advisor as well. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip through these last three. Um, uh, these are just kind of some of the frequently asked questions, but I'm going to open it up to all of you. So let's just go to the end slide with my email. And there are 45 minutes in. And as Suzanne and I talked about several years ago, we like to leave some time for questions at the end. So I am going to uh, open it up to any. Can I just quickly room. ask the last slide that you showed there, Ryan, um, that had those resources? Uh, that was mm -hmm. an internal slide from uh, your company. That's correct. Yep. Okay. And I just shared that with you because I want you to see like how many resource or what, what, how robust the research is out there and what is available to different investment managers. Right. And again, it, that's just to show you what we have, but there are other you know folks out there that have something like that and they should be sharing that with you if that's what you want to do. 
Okay. So Are there questions here, from our members? Um, Please feel free to uh, raise your hand or just speak up. Um, so I, I have one here from John. It's a little bit a uh, different topic here. Um, and I think uh, real quickly, Suzanne, we have on for October, right? We're going to do the review of the 403B, 457. Is that the October topic, yes, I believe? That's correct. Yeah. And, and John, with that as well, um, because that presentation is not super long, it's probably about 20 minutes. I'm going to add a uh, you know monthly recap to the beginning of that. So we'll be going over some of these these questions you have. But with the federal debt limit expiration fast approaching, what effect do you see if you go have on the overall stock market? I'm afraid the deal will not get done before the deadline will cause chaos for the economy and market. Do you agree or am I overreacting? So, uh, you know, good question. So we've seen this before, right? We saw, um, what was it, back in 2012, 2013, I think we had this, you know, same issue, uh, reversal of, uh, well, actually, no, I think it was the same uh, in the White House and in Congress. Um, but we've seen this before. So I think that, you know, Obviously, if Congress can't get its act together and the government were to default, that could be catastrophic. Do I think they will let that happen? Absolutely not. Uh, do I think there's posturing going on to get some concessions on both sides? Absolutely. That's what happened last time. And that would be what I think is happening. Do I think that uh, the U.S. is going to default on its debt? Absolutely not. That would be catastrophic. Um, in the short term, is that going to cause some anxiety and some volatility in the market? Absolutely. Uh, September and October tend to be the two most volatile months in the market anyhow. Um, it's the two months in the market that our strategies usually work the best because we do a lot of covered call writing, which requires a lot of uh, volatility to get uh, option premium. Um, that being said, uh, you know, I want to remind you that the best months in the market tend to follow September and October because you get what's called the Santa Claus rally between November and December going into January. So that tends to be the, the best um, uh, the best months in the market. So let's see. Next one. What are some examples of ESG index ETF funds offered by Fidelity, Vanguard, Schwab, et cetera? Uh, Don, I appreciate the question. Uh, that's you know not something I uh, would like to provide, only because uh, I am a fiduciary and just to throw ETFs and uh, so index funds. Let me say real quick. If, if you're owning an index fund, S&P 500, a Vanguard, you know, total market or something like that, you're, you're not ESG investing. You're not sustainable investing whatsoever. Okay. Uh, because you're owning everything in the index, right? Everything in the index includes everything. So there's no screener there. So it, I tell people, if you're in, a, there are ETFs that track the column in 900, which is one of the indexes that tracks uh, ESG investing, right? So there are ETFs that follow that. But I want to remind you, I don't, if, and I, I, I'll say this to anyone out there. If you're an index investor, you're probably your single priority is fees, right? Or perceived fees, I should say. Um, because, you know, fees are also should be included in what's called an opportunity cost. So if you're an index investor and your priority is fees, you are probably not going to be a sustainable investor because it's going to be difficult to go through all that screening and find all that stuff that really follows how you feel about investing and to really single that stuff out and own an index. It's nearly impossible. So I, I think if you're an index investor because of low fees and low management costs, you need to decide what is more important to you. And I would say that if you were in my office asking me for advice, I would say, what is more important to you that your investments follow your, because as I showed earlier, you're not going to sacrifice performance because you're in an index or not, okay? Or it's possible to not sacrifice performance. So the the, the bigger thing needs to be the psychological hurdle of, well, indexing may be low cost, and which is not always the case, and would, that can be a different discussion, but is low cost, or I really want my investments to follow how I feel about the world and what I, how I want to impact the world, what my legacy is going to be, et cetera, et cetera. Does Fidelity have an ESG index fund that you consider to be legitimately qualified to be called ESG? Well, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I don't know all the Fidelity funds. You know, you could bring me one and I could do some research on it. But again, and I know there's Fidelity uh, advisors available to you within the, the, the Fidelity 403B forty-seven plan. Um, but, you know, again, uh, I would ask that question. And if you're not getting the answers you like, then I would go somewhere else. But I think that's a fair question. You know, call up the 403B 47 administrator, ask for an advisor in Fidelity and say, you know, I'm 
I want my investments to follow a more sustainable path. Um, you know, what is your process or what resources do you have to guide me along that way? Uh, thanks, right? Absolutely, John. I think UC just announced a new SG fund available to us. What do you think of that one? Uh, Kathy, I have not looked at it at all, so I can't comment. If you want to send me an email uh, with a link to what it is, I'd be happy to take a look at it. But that, again, would be offered through Fidelity. For anyone who wants to have that discussion with the Fidelity rep, uh, their email is listed on our website, retirement.ucsc.edu. You go to the activities page and you can scroll down and there's um, his contact and you can set up a free consultation with him. His name is Ron Appling. So, um, you know, all of those Fidelity questions are really better addressed directly to the Fidelity representative. Absolutely. Yes, very true. 